What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. Look, Living Corporate is a digital media network, right? Not just a single podcast. Okay, hear me again. I said a digital media network, not just a single podcast. So when I say digital media network, what does that mean? Digital media network means that we're creating all sorts of different types of media, all sorts of different types of media, podcasts, vodcasts, blogs, right? Uh, like talk chat spaces, you know what I mean? Uh, social media content. Right. Threads, things of that nature, all types of content. And what is that network? What is this content all meant to do? It's meant to center and amplify black and brown people at work, center and amplify black and brown people at work. So often in this whole DEI space or whatever you want to call it, DEI, IED, JEI, you know what I'm saying? The RZA, Wu Tang, whatever you calling it. Right. Shout out to Wu Tang uh, forever. Uh, but whatever you calling it. There's this common thread of centering of the most overrepresented, right? So what am I really trying to say? A lot of this DEI work centers white people and white feelings. That's what that's really what this space has devolved into, or maybe it already it always was. I mean, honestly, we've talked about that at nauseum uh, for the past several years. But the point is, is that living corporate exists to center and amplify the marginalized voices, black and brown queer, black and brown disabled, black and brown women, black and brown trans, black and brown non-binary, black and brown first gen, black and brown people at work. That's what we do. And we interview executives, elected officials, activists, artists, influencers, the list goes on and on and on. And we're always, always, always bringing it back to the experiences of the most marginalized and we're speaking truth to power by challenging the very systems that exist and continue to persist to benefit everybody but black and brown people at work. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we do. We're not really here to like coddle or pat uh, big corporations on the back that make billions of dollars every year. Um, we're here to really have authentic, real conversations in a corporate world. OK, that's what we're trying to do. And that's what we're not trying to do. That's what we're doing. Shout out to the living corporate team. I'm so excited about this conversation you're about to hear. See you soon. Sharon Berkman, how are you doing? I am doing so well and absolutely overjoyed to be having this conversation with you, Zach. Sharon, you know, I I, I want to say, I want to start by saying that you know, there are a ton of like, what's the word? Like workplace personality type tools. And, like, mm -hmm. you know, and more every day. <laughs> and more every day. I think, I mean, I think the one that people love um, um, really, really leaning against uh, is Myers-Briggs, right? But there's a ton, but there's, there's tons. Um, I recall back when, and I'm gonna shout her out because she is, was a phenomenal mentor sponsor to me, Carmen Alston. Um, yes. So Carmen was t was very, very insistent um, that I become Berkman certified. And this was sheesh now. This was almost a decade ago um, mm. when I pursued my when I got my cert my Berkman certification. And I mean, we had, and I still got our picture sharing. I got everything with my little, yeah, I, yeah. little certificate. And um, and so I, I think what I want to do is I, I want to one start by getting your perspective on explain this land to explain this landscape of workplace personality because there's a, that's a huge industry and then it is. and then two talk a little bit about Berkman and, and how maybe y'all are different I'd be happy to well one of the things that is notable for us is that we have been around Berkman method has been around for 71 years we we actually sec celebrated last year more than seven decades and i would say to anybody that the reason i believe we stand out is different even though there are now hundreds of thousands of, of other assessments out there that look at personality and they they're not wrong but what makes berkman special in the and unique in the field is that is an insight that my father had years ago and that is that when you want to understand people, you've got to go to relationships. And if you want to really understand an individual, you need to look at 
at these multiple layers. In other words, how do I perceive myself? How do I perceive other people? And also what uh, energizes me in terms of my interests? Because all three of those are really important. Myers-Briggs, DISC, and, and many of the well-known assessments, they do a fine job of giving you what Berkman would call our usual behavior. In other words, that's how we see ourselves and describe ourselves. That's how we tend to show up. But as, as what is it that uh, TV thinks, it, but wait, there's more. Right. There's so much more complexity, though, to human beings. No one is 100% introvert or 100% extrovert. And as we know, the more we look at human nature, the more we see its nuances and complexity. So Berkman would say, okay, if a, a typical assessment tells you, for example, if you look at a tree, what kind of tree is it? You know, walk up and you see it above ground, you see, oh, it's an oak or a palm or a pine. But what Berkman also gives you is not just a type or a description of what shows up. We go deeper than that and describe the root system that's actually nurturing that tree and allowing it to be a living organism. And Berkman calls that our needs. These motivational needs are, are what makes Berkman, I think, survive 71 years. And now we're going, we're going to head into our 72nd pretty soon because we are the only ones that say you've got to understand the motivations at the deepest level. And these oftentimes are, they're not seen easily by others unless they know the person really, really well. And sometimes in many cases, they're a little bit of a surprise even to the individual. He may, he or she may say, well, uh, now I understand why I can For example, in social energy, I can really love being around people all day. And once I leave the office, I really want my, my quiet, autonomous, independent time. I recharge by either being alone or being with just one or two people that I'm very, very comfortable with. And what we say is good, good for you. That is absolutely the best way for you to, to, to manage yourself. Being, um, it, it, so in that case, Berkman called that a high low, high usual with a lower need. We have nine relational components that where people can show up in a whole variety of ways. And all this diversity works just fine. It's all normal. It's all natural. It's, it just makes us who we are. And um, there's no need for for anybody to um, ever worry about that, except when those needs go unmet, just like the roots of the tree in a drought, then we start feeling certain degrees of stress. And the longer this uh, deprivation happens, clearly, the more stress we're going to feel. And so Berkman says, if you understand what your needs are, and those include interests as well, you are going to be a happier, better, more effective version of your natural self, but it's just, it's a matter. That's what awareness is, Zach. It's not just self-awareness. It's social awareness. It's awareness of others. In addition, the ones we live with, the ones we work with day to day. You know, it's I, one, I appreciate that. Um, it's kind of like level setting in context, you know, as I think about, um, identity and I think about, you know, I, I recall, um, and I don't have my Berkman in front of me, like my chart. Uh, but what I what I think about as just as when I was when I was being uh, Berkman certified, mm -hmm. going through the course, and I recall again this was like a decade ago, but I recall at that time like you know for me because I was a first generation really like kind of corporate professional, mm -hmm. um, I had real anxieties about you know not necessarily measuring up and being one of the onlys in a space. Cause um, I want to say actually my, at that time, besides Carmen, <laughs> I was the only other black person on that entire floor. Cause we were in the, we were uh, in the corporate office. I, I, I guess I'm curious about, as you think about like the, the concept of needs and like what you mm. need to be successful in like as we, and, and against this Berkman model, do you see, points of commonality 
for people who are of the minority and meaning like, you know, they, they might be first generation professionals or first generation uh, Americans well, in the corporate yeah, space. Yeah, sure. I'm going to answer that in two parts. One, when you look at a Berkman profile summary that has all the different uh, percentages and, and, and scores on it, the way we show it now, you cannot look, you cannot tell male, female, old, young, black, white, brown. There's no suggestion that, that we're not seeing any commonality. So it's just a human being and sure. they're all, they're all over the map. Um, but when we look at our different international cultures, what stands out there, and this is something I really appreciate, is that we see the same trends, uh, whether whether that person lives in Middle East, Europe, Australia, um, South, North America, Canada, what what we see in terms of human behavioral patterns is parallel. So they one country might be a little bit a percentage point or two higher in a certain trait, but the pattern of whether we expect the majority to answer in a certain way, the pattern stays identical. And that's what, what I think at the end of the day, as Maya Angelou said so brilliantly, we're all more alike than we are different. But those differences are really critical to society. It's it, they're critical to us being able to function in a company, in a team. We we need those differences to survive. And uh, yet, it's interesting how much uh, when you get into the research, there there aren't the differences you might expect at at the Berkman level. It's interesting because as I think about like one, I I'm always curious about like you know, the like workplace personality tests mm -hmm. and things of nature, mainly because I believe they can be a really strong point of inform in how you manage talent. Right. And so what I'm curious about is like, where would you envision Berkman, like a Berkman study or, um, you know, it, how would, how would you see that or envision that being paired with an organization's goal to be more inclusive and and equitable and how they manage their teams. Well, I th I think the way I look at it is when you invest in in development of the employee and that includes being able to give them the advantage of the Berkman information and and also enhance the relationships between colleagues and teams and supervisor and direct reports. When you're doing those things you're saying I care about my people and I value them. Um, and you know, what you mentioned a minute ago, you said, um, I was worried if I'd measure up. I have to tell you that has nothing to do with skin pigment. That I think that's a very normal thing, whether people admit it or not. Now it's made to your point. I think it's made more difficult when you have to walk into a situation where you feel like you are in the minority. I've been not so much as it right now, I feel like many of the things that I walk into it in terms of meetings, there's a there's a pretty good balance of male, female people at the at the boardroom table. But when I started in this uh, in my role in early 2000s, very often I'd be the only female in the room or, you know, there are two of us and then there'd be 40 males. And so I, can't, I do relate to what you're talking about. But I think if truth be told, uh, if you got all of them to be honest with you, everybody shares that. Am I, am I good enough? Can I measure up? Um, you know, the old imposter syndrome thing actually is not gone. <laughs> right, right. No, I 100% agree that, you know, most folks struggle with like deep insecurities about being mm -hmm. accepted or not. I think my challenge to that would be that black and brown folks typically face um, even a, more yeah and a more yeah. and a more and a more pointed pressure mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that they actually do belong right like there's exactly this... you know and and shame on us as and on on us as a nation that um this has been allowed to persist for way too long and um uh, there in my view and i don't want i'm not meaning to be political but i do believe that um Systemic racism has been an issue and probably not just here, but 
but certainly has been in the in the history of U.S. And my hope is that we're learning better now. And I wish we were further down the road, to be honest, Zach. But I that's why I think Berkman that, you know, we're trying to expand people's perception of what diversity really is. And of course, equity always matters. And if anything, I would say for a company, if anything could aid and enhance the feeling of being included, it would be showing people how they can be less judgmental. And I'm talking about like personality wise sure. that in a meeting. Okay. Here's a, here's a story, true story years ago. I was standing in a line in New York City, and when I got, it was a to, to speak with a person who had been the speaker. And when I got ready to introduce myself, the person behind me heard me say Berkman. Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, are you Berkman from that personality test? <laughs> and when she said that, I, mm, yeah, you know, I wasn't quite sure whether that was, whether she liked it or was upset. Mm-hmm. But we got into a little conversation, and she said, <coughs> excuse me. I just want you to know that in my company, and this was in Manhattan, by the way, Mm -hmm. um, we uh, we did a team building with a consultant and we used the Berkman. And in my uh, office, there was a lady that I had to work with every day, but she drove me crazy. And uh, I really thought she just got up in the morning and came to work to get on my bad side. And she said, after we did the Berkman, I realized that. Um, actually, I understood where her strengths were, where she was coming from, and that the role she had was was beneficial to the team. And so we eventually ended up gradually uh, getting those barriers came down. She became someone that I could even relate to. And sometimes we even have lunch together now. And I thought she was my sworn enemy before we did the Berkman. So I think that, see, that to me is about inclusion. If once you can put the judgment aside and say, wait a minute, this is why that human being is so valuable and why they ha- I have these strengths. They have those complementary strengths, but we all contribute to the whole. And so if anything in my my brain spells uh, an effort toward more inclusivity, it's being more compassionate about our various different interests, different needs and the different ways we we really do add value to any organization. And that's the corporate side of Berkman, but it's also the human side. You know, to that end, right? Like I think about this, the future of work. And I think about, you know, Gen Zers, I'm, mm. a, I'm millennial. People keep on, and I've, I've said this to a few folks, uh, Sharon, is that people love continue to talk about millennials as if millennials are like, you know, like the youngest group and like millennials are turning 40, you know? So like, Really, you know, there's Gen Z now, Zach. That's what I was saying, right? Like, yeah. and so you, you, we talk about Gen Z, and that's really more so like my siblings. Like, my siblings are in their early 20s, but there's some, they're Gen Zers who are, you know, one or two years into their careers. I'm curious as you think about Berkman and, um, and its future, right? You talked about the fact that it's been around for over 70 years and it come, you know, mm-hmm. 71 years coming up on 72. You think about you think about Berkman like between now and like 2030 as this new generation of work comes you know comes into the 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 workplace what is your vision or you know where do you what role do you see it playing as you know leadership organizations facing probably the most politically engaged yeah uh racially diverse diverse um and um and, and and most diverse from a from a sexual orientation perspective, like you know, what do you, what do you think about that in terms of the role that Berkman can play to drive or to help support uh, inclusion and development and transition? Yes, I don't know uh, specifically how we do that, but in a general sense, I would say it it again kind of circling back to the inclusivity that can be nurtured and enhanced when we better understand self and others because we're hopefully going to be less defensive less judgmental mm. and and i would say compassionate understanding um i don't know if you'd heard this already zach but the original name for the berkman method 
that my dad had, he called it a test of social comprehension. Mm. And, and, you know, the other day, a, a while back, I was thinking about that, that the word to comprehend means to understand. Mm. And so really, it's about how well can we promote um, a much more appreciative, inclusive, compassionate understanding of the people we live with, the people we work with, uh, the people that make society a better place to, to live in. Um, and that would be my dream. What's really, you know, not much has changed over the years in terms of the questionnaire, relatively little. Um, but what has changed radically over the years is technology. So, you know, that that was something my dad always is a visionary. He wasn't an engineer, but he was a uh, he could foresee and was a visionary in terms of knowing that, for example, in the 60s, he was the first to put Berkman on a mainframe IBM. And uh, in this for this, he almost got kicked out of the American Psychological Association. They they were concerned. They said, you know, Roger, uh, you're putting uh, information about people on a machine and, and we don't think that's appropriate. <laughs> so, of course, you know, fast forward now uh, to 2010 and we were the first to, uh, to put, was it, let's see, no, it was earlier than that. We went on the internet in 2001 and mm -hmm. now we're looking at a platform and we're looking at, you know, we, we can we use everything that technology provides to all companies to really um, expand the ease of understanding Berkman and receiving the information. So, yeah, we've changed uh, some cosmetic things, you know, graphics and such questionnaire covers have changed. And mostly the most dramatic has been what technology has enabled. And oh. I, you know, we're, we're working on an app now called meeting EQ. Uh, so it, it's, if you can walk into a meeting and, pull up several things that would be useful for you to remember before I go on to my meeting with Zach, I, I need to remember these three things, you know, so that's some, that's kind of, that's in process at the moment. That's really exciting. You know, as I think about Berkman and, and tools like it, but really like speaking on Berkman for this conversation is I, mm -hmm. I think about the power of, of insight, right? Like being able to understand the why behind people's what um, understanding, mm -hmm. you know, the types of environments they need to be successful. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversations around the future of work and working from home versus working mm -hmm. in office. And um, you know, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, Zach? <laughs> what am I? Now thoughts that we're on? trying to get out of COVID days. Well, you know, so here's the thing. I think all this technology has to, um, it has to account for something. I think that, um, we should be able to provide flexibility if folk, mm -hmm. there are people who are, who are extremely, uh, what, what, what are we talking about? What, like where you, what you need, right? So there are people who based on what they need, they need in-person interaction mm -hmm. and they need the socialization of, and human, pro, you know, human proximity. They need that. They need that to be, yes. to, to function. To be, I, yeah. To be motivated and energized. And so, they do. and so in the spirit of inclusion, I believe, those people should be empowered to have an environment that allows them to do to to get that. And I think especially if their job naturally calls for those things. And mm -hmm. again, in the spirit of inclusion, I believe that, you know, if there are folks like me, I'll for example, Shannon, I'm like, I'm really I'm like, I can I can go really long without having to be in person with anybody. I love my family. I have you and I talked about off mic. I have yeah. a I have a well, two year old. Yeah. But you have lower uh, social energy needs, which means that you can you can enjoy the, that independent time with just a few people or just well, special people. You got it. You got it. And, I, and, it, and it's very special to me. I very much so appreciate it. So I so what I don't think is that it's a one size fit all. I think. But I, but, I, but, I, but I'll say I'll say it, I'll say it simply. I believe that remote work uh, or rather. Uh, yeah, re remote work, not ro uh, work from home, because people can work from all sorts of places. I mm -hmm. think re I think remote work is here to stay. I believe it's that. Here to stay. I believe that it's. I think it's imperative that organizations continue to leverage their technology and be innovative and creative in how they do their work. And I think it's important to provide options for those who have higher socialization needs and who get their energy, to your point, from 
from a bunch of different people. Right. Actually, now what we can do, Zach, is look at a person's Berkman profile and make some pretty useful deductions about who's going to be able to be very productive and more than effective working remotely and, and who really is going to choose that they can be more effective if they come into the office. Um, particularly, you know, if we look at our Berkman map, um, mm-hmm. the people on the right side of the map, say you say, well, I'll call it the east side, um, they really to do collaborative work, to brainstorm in a team setting, bounce ideas off each other. The human connection, uh, at least during the workday, is can be very valuable, at least part of the time. Sure. The people that are on the task-oriented side, in, in our case, if we use our colors, the red-yellow, very often, if they're doing coding, if they're doing accounting, they need the focus. And if they're disciplined and, and um, you know, have a good all, remote setting, they can be 100 percent effective remotely. And so I think you're exactly right. I think remote is here to stay. And, and we, you know, we certainly see we've had hybrid it in place now since the middle of 21 and it's working just fine. And we have um, but but we have certain days and certain times that people do gather in the office. And then those who thrive on the remote work do that a little more often. And the ones that choose to come in the office have that option anytime they want. Well, I think, I think here's the other piece, though. I, I would imagine um, in environments where leadership, it, there, where there's, higher, there's a higher trust quotient, mm-hmm. that flexibility around remote and hybrid working is going to be higher. Whereas, yeah. like, if we're in a really um, controlling... I use a bunch of other words, but for the sake of this conversation, I'll say controlling environment with um, low levels of autonomy or like, you know, respect to innovation and things of that nature. And it's really more about like, I'm just telling you what to do. I would imagine, you know, you want, they, 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 they are more resistant to that. I mean, I think we saw recently, there was like a CEO, huge uh, banking organization who was tracking Mm -hmm. um, zoom meetings on Fridays and, and people checking in um, or they're like scanning out with their badges on Fridays and saying that people need to be in more meetings and need to be working more. People are slacking off and we're laying people off. It's like, okay, well, you know, like that's just, and I, and I had a whole conversation with somebody who was, um, who was like a younger baby boomer. And I said, mm-hmm. Hey, I said, this is, they were like, they were like, yeah, the, the age of these slackers are about to get let go. And I said, that is not, I recognize you feel that way. That is not reflective of this future of work. If you think that Gen Zers are going to want to be sitting in front of a desk for seven to 10 hours a day downtown where they have to spend 60 bucks or whatever on gas, Mm -hmm. you're, you're delusional. Like you are, you have a, you have a different, (laughs) you have a a different and frankly incorrect interpretation of what's happening right now. You know what I mean? True. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if, if you're a good manager and you're checking in, whether it's remote or in person, um, you can track the productivity, you know, if you're, if you're managing well, and if you're managing well, there is no reason why you can't either be hybrid remote or in person, if that is what you prefer. But one of the things that happened for us in COVID is that we just like you came to the office uh, in person years ago, 2014, yes, yes. because all of our certifications were classroom, were in person. Uh, over, over, let's see, 20, by 2017, we had uh, moved to eight hours of pre-work, which people did online before they came. So I would, I would call it a hybrid training. Eight hours of pre-work remotely. Oh, it could be spread out over 30 days or more. And then they would come for what I called a three-day intensive in the classroom where they did uh, exercises and and learned from other people as well um, um, to go deeper with Berkman more rapidly because they'd done all their pre-work. Yes. And they'd learned terminology ahead of time. Yes. That actually really did improve their ability to, to get better and deeper in three days with Berkman and in, in the intensive. <clears throat> and then they go home and they would you know, be able to do their, their feedback conversations and practice and take a little quiz and we stamp them certified. Well, along comes the pandemic 
we could no longer do any classroom whatsoever. And so our head of training within about five weeks or so was able to pivot to a, an online version of certification, which was pretty radical for us because, I mean, here we've been around all these years and we'd always, the certification started, I think in the early seventies, we started certifying other people to do Berkman besides just the staff at Berkman. And now we're, um, trying to do this online. So the, the online version takes five days and in, you have to be pretty, they, they really pretty much mastered a virtual uh, training, I think, or oh, they have, they've done really well. And some people just can never travel and it's ne- they never get certified unless they could do it remotely. And then last week we had uh, 18 people in the office getting certified. And a few of them said, well, I wanted to wait because I prefer to do the in-person. The great mm-hmm. thing in today's world is that we have choices. You know, some do better with virtual, some do better in the classroom. And guess what? That's part of diversity. Yeah. And so for us at Berkman, the more inclusive approach is to offer both. I, I love it. Um, I, again, I, I, I recall... And even though I have not kept doing my certification, what I will say, Sharon, is what I appreciated about Berkman at that time, because I remember I was really trying to figure out, okay, what is it that I need? Because Carmen and I would have ongoing conversations about, hey, like, what what is the environment that's good for you? Mm -hmm. you, And and, and how, how do you behave? Like, how are you operating and performing under high stress? And then how do you perform when you're actually getting the things that you need? And she was very encouraging. And so... It was just, it was, for me, it was a really great, like, personal, yeah. almost like self-discovery tool. Oh, yeah, that's what it, well, that's exactly what it's intended to be. And I I love that you use the word discovery, because that's when the light bulbs go off, when our best moments, when, when we sit down, and now we call it a conversation rather than a feedback, because it's not a performance review. It's uh, when I sit down and walk a person through their Berkman, what we call now the signature report, which is a good starting point to just kind of give a quick overview of the five different dimensions of the person's Berkman report. It can't cover all the bases, but it's a great place to start. And so we, we, we show them the Berkman map that you are here, just it's broad, but it gets them oriented. And then we talk about how they show up, their usual behavior. It's always positive. Uh, What they need to stay recharged, those motivation, motivating underlying needs. And those, again, that's really the secret sauce of the Berkman, a dad would say. That's our, he called it the Coca-Cola formula. That's (laughs) the part that makes Berkman really special. And then uh, how we could show up if we do get pulled into stress, which, you know, life is not easy. I think we all, we're all human. We all have our days that we experience stress. And that is like, for me, that's the warning light that comes up on the car dashboard when you need gas or you need to check tire pressure or check your engine, the check engine light. When that comes on, what do we do? We pull over and we take care of the car. We need to do the same thing for ourselves as humans because we're infinitely more intelligent and more complex than an automobile. And then finally, the last part is the career part where we've now validated. um, We take all of the above, the interests, the, uh, in the usual me and the and the needs um, all the 298 questions that you answer the simple questions you fill in on the Berkman questionnaire and we mix all that together and what comes out is that your top six matches to the US Department of Labor occupational outlook website each job family is pretty ginormous and, and inclusive of, of many things, but they do fall into certain kinds of categories of careers. And so the, the final part of the Berkman for the person after they've done usual needs, stress and interests is to see what do I look like in terms of my career matches. So whether you're a student in college or high school going to college, college going to a job, job going through a career path in the organization, that's where looking at these job family matches can be so helpful. I was curious because you have, you mentioned that you're not still certified. You can be re-upped, but I wondered if you had seen the signature report that we released in 2016. 
I had not. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I need to walk you through that, Zach. You know, when it's a good time for you, um, let's set a time and do that. I want to do that. I very much so want to do that because one, you know, we had talked again, we had talked offline about even just like the different ways, um, like just the, the intersection of identity and Berkman and how, how this can just support inclusion Mm -hmm. and the workplace and better team and more inclusive teaming and leadership. Uh, But you had talked a little bit about the neurodiversity report um, Mm -hmm. that Berkman had developed. Yes, uh, that basically, if a person wants to add that on, it's it doesn't come in the signature report, but it can be a, an add-on report. And what it will specifically say is, you know, if you're uh, on the autism spectrum or if or the spectrum for dyslexia, Tourette's or uh, dyscalculia or something like that, just anyway, it's a, it's, it's a rare one, but it's there. That's included in the ND report. Probably the thing we're seeing the most of right now is um, people that have been diagnosed on the autism spectrum that want to take their Berkman report and go a step further by by how do I, if I'm the employer of a person who's been diagnosed, because we don't diagnose, we just take people, you know, and, and say, here's something useful for you to read if you've already been diagnosed. But it could be for the person themselves or it could be for their employer to do better, a better job of understanding how to uh, set that person up for success. You know, the term they, that they use in, in the um, neurodiverse community is, is accommodations. But we would just say we call it empowering the person to be more successful in the corporate world. And I, I think the, we do empower people, Zach, when we honor the way they are uniquely wired. Because, you know, we don't really see two Berkman. It, even if some of the Berkman reporting on two individuals happens to look rather similar, fact is they are, they wear it differently. And they are mm-hmm. going to be entirely different human beings with their own story, their own context, and their own life goals. And so all of that, you have to put all of that data into a helpful context. And that's what our Berkman consultants are are wired, excuse me, are trained, rather, to do, is to try to help appreciate a person in a, in a very scientifically validated way. But... You know, if the at the end of the day, what I love about doing the Berkman conversation is affirming how each of their traits and diverse interests is their superpower. That's that's what makes people. Um, it's it's so easy to appreciate people when you have that understanding, and if you understand, it's e- much easier to be inclusive. Right. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, it's a requirement. It is. Sharon, look, we could talk all day. I appreciate you for being on the show. Um, I'm excited about Berkman and all the work that y'all continue to do um, to not only help uh, folks understand one another, but help folks understand themselves. Mm. Um, Before I let you go, are there any parting words you have for us? Oh, I think the main thing that I would, would urge people to do is be compassionate toward themselves and others because, you know, being a, a, a complex human being is wonderful. And it's also not always so straightforward and easy for us to understand one another. But when we stop and take the time to see each other as uniquely wonderful humans, the world is a better place to live in. I love it. I love it. Sharon Bergman, your friend of the show. I look forward to us connecting um, after uh, after some major events. this Yeah, uh, this that's fall. right. So please do, Zach. Uh, I look forward to, to more conversations with you. No doubt. Talk to you later. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Yo, thank you so much for rapping, hanging out with us this week on Living Corporate. Make sure that you check us check our content out on living dash corporate please say the dash.com 
you can see our entire network of shows. We have all types of content that we've been publishing. Um, that's all focused on black and brown folks at work, different lenses, mental health, career development, executive leadership, right? Wellness, freedom, all types of different lenses, but it's all focused on historically marginalized, oppressed, exploited, under invested, disinvested people. That's what we're here for. So also click the link in the show notes. Make sure you check out our merch. Cop a hoodie. It's getting cool. Oh no, it's not getting cool. It's not getting cool. Eh, I don't know. Depends on where you at. It's always some, you know what I'm saying? I'm in Houston, right? So it's never really cool. You know what I mean? It's always wet and warm or hot and humid. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, but I'm sure it's hoodie season somewhere. So make sure you go on the, go on the website. If you don't want to cop a hoodie, cop a tank top. You know what I'm saying? Cop a mask. You know what I'm saying? Still wear a mask. Look, come on now. The pandemic is still a pandemic. And I know y'all don't want to act like it is, but people still getting sick out here. Trust me. I got coworkers. People be, okay, I got friends. All right. Be careful. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you, 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 you get familiar. You know what I'm saying? Take care of yourself. Uh, and look, until next time, this has been Zach. Thank you so much for rocking with Living Corporate. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.